all right, why don't we start up? Um, so we're continuing to do syntax. I think I promised you that I was going to have a look at the syllabus, and I sort of did. I think uh, if I think we will probably finish syntax not today, but uh, on Thursday, and then we will stop doing syntax. So if there's anyone who is tired of syntax, I'm sorry. Please bear with it for another week, and then there will be no more syntax uh, for a while. Um, this is today's XKCD. It's uh, not true as far as I know, or, or maybe I'm the only one who didn't get a word. I, that's, I guess that's another possibility. We'll have to ask, uh, ask your TAs um, uh, in, um, in the sessions tomorrow. Uh, okay, so um, one topic that we keep coming back to uh, is the fact, which seems to be a fact, that uh, although there are many kinds of languages in the world, there are not as many as you could imagine. So uh, various types of languages, places where we've seen that uh, languages make choices with respect to how they do this or that or the other syntactic thing, but uh, you don't find all of the choices that are, that are logically possible. Um, so for example, we've say, seen that there are languages that move their WH phrases to the left periphery of the clause, and there are languages that just leave their WH phrases where they are. But there don't appear to be languages that move their WH phrases anywhere else. Like there aren't languages that move them to the end of the clause or that put them in the exact middle of the clause or anything like that. And so there's variation, but not as much variation as, uh, as you could imagine. I want to talk about another way, another case of that kind, a place where uh, there's more than one way to build a language, but there aren't as many ways as there could be. Um, so we're going to talk about the embedded clause uh, of this sentence. I thought that Mary ate sushi with chopsticks. And actually, um, let's, just as a class exercise, let's diagram that embedded clause. So uh, don't worry about the matrix clause. So that. Uh, what's her name, Mary? Oh dear, I'm going to make it future. We'll eat sushi with chopsticks. So um, let's let's draw a tree for this. Uh, maybe we could start by labeling everything. Um, what's chopsticks? What type of word is that? It's a noun. And with preposition and sushi. Noun, particularly delicious noun, and eat is a verb, and will is a tense, and marry is a noun, one of my favorite nouns, and that is a complementizer. See, excellent. Um, and if anybody's sitting there quietly thinking, what? Where did all that come from? Um, ask your TAs, or we can talk about it now. Is there anything on here that people are like, wait, no, why did you do that? No? OK. All right, so now let's begin merging things. Um, Somebody give me two nodes on this tree that I ought to merge. Faith? With and chopsticks. With and chopsticks. And what label should the resulting thing have? Yeah, this is a prepositional phrase. And because this is the highest thing with the node n, I'll give it a p too. So that's now a noun phrase. Yeah? Um, Joseph? Eat and sushi. And what label should I give this? Yeah, it's going to be a v bar in the end. I'll just call it a v for now. And now this is an np because its label didn't project. Yeah? What else should I merge? That Mary. That Mary? Well, I could. Yeah? And what would I, what would I project there? This is going to be a complementizer phrase. OK, possibly. And then this would be a noun phrase. We did that. Yeah? Any other nodes here that I ought to merge? Including nodes that we've made in the course of doing this. Yes? Eat sushi with chopsticks. Yeah, eat sushi and with chopsticks. And what label will that have? That's a verb phrase. Cool. And so now this is a V bar. Joseph was right. Anything else I should merge? Uh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Faith. I think we should merge these two things, yes. And we should give, as you just said, the, the whole thing, the label T. Yeah, you're right. Is that what you were going to say? Yeah. What else should I merge? Yes? Uh, just a question. Yeah. Um, you, um, oh. So here we have three nodes. This is a nice example. Here we have three nodes all with the label V. Um, P is just the name for the highest one. Yeah. And the lowest one doesn't get a mark, or sometimes you'll see people put a, a raised zero just to mark the fact that it's the lowest form. I haven't been bothering with that. Uh, and then everything else is given the, the label bar. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just 
higher than zero and lower than p. Um, syntactic math, we count zero bar p. That's how we count. What other things should I merge with each other? Does anybody remember the EPP? One of my favorite P's. It says uh, that TP must have a specifier. So it's responsible for the fact that um, you can't just say, uh, you can say things like, um, is obvious that syntax is fun. Um, you put this it here, and this it is what we were calling an expletive. It's a meaningless thing that you put there uh, so that TP can have a specifier. If I were going to draw a tree for it is obvious that syntax is fun, it would have a TP, and it would be in the specifier of that. And we'd have a verb phrase, is obvious, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so I'd have a tree sort of like that one. Joseph? Uh, well, I encouraged you not to worry about the answer to that, but the answer is that it stands for extended projection principle. And it is also a parameter. Sorry, let me see if I can spell principle correctly. It is also a parameter in that uh, English has it, and there are other languages that have it, like French, but it's actually not all that common. There are plenty of languages out there that don't have this. Yeah. Okay. So there's a general principle that TP uh, must have a specifier, that is, um, there must be a structure like this one where there's a TP that has as its daughters something, it's usually a noun phrase, and then a, and then a T bar. So we're not yet there. Um, this TP doesn't have a specifier, so it needs one. Yes? Can that be a specifier? Uh, so in a sentence where a CP is the um, subject of a clause, so in a sentence like that syntax is fun is obvious, where the subject of the predicate is obvious is this CP, that syntax is fun, where that is its head, uh, then yeah. So if this were a, a clause, then, then yeah, it could be the specifier of TP. Joseph? I think we might want to think about it that way. Yeah, we might want to make Mary the specifier of TP, satisfying the EPP. Yeah. And then um, all we've got left is a C, and we can make that C uh, the sister of this TP. Yeah. Is that a tree that people are not too unnerved by? All of you have all the nerves you had before you looked at it. Yeah. OK. All right. Um, so there is a tree for um, the embedded clause, the bold-faced embedded clause, that Mary ate sushi with chopsticks. And here is hopefully the same tree. Oh, I put it in a could. Yeah, so that Mary could eat sushi with chopsticks. Uh, same deal. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Now, uh, let me call your attention to a fact about this tree, which some of you may already have noticed. Um, general rule when you're drawing a tree for English, that if you have a head and the head has a sister, the head goes before the sister. So we have prepositional phrases like with chopsticks and um, verb phrases that have, if they have an object, you get the verb before the object, eat sushi. And T, like could or will, which we have on the board, precedes its complement, the verb phrase. And C, the that, which is up there, precedes its complement, which is the TP. We have all these blue arrows on the tree. The blue arrows are just meant to, you don't have to draw them if you're drawing an English tree. They're just there to, uh, dramatically represent the fact that here we have all these heads and they're preceding their complements. Yeah. What would English look like if heads followed their complements? Well, you'd get word orders like that one. Marry chopsticks with sushi eat could that, which is not English. Yeah. But it is Japanese. Um, so in Japanese, the way you say that Mary could eat sushi with chopsticks is literally something like Mary Chopsticks with, sushi eat, good, that. If any of you 
have studied Japanese or are thinking about studying Japanese, be aware that this is something you'll have to learn to cope with, saying your sentences in this different order. Yeah? So you say, Neri ga hashi de sushi o taberezu to. And not just Japanese, but, well, lots of other languages as well. So that's the basic word order for Tibetan and for Korean and for Navajo and Basque and Chaha and a zillion other languages out there. It's a cross linguistically very common word order. In fact, if you just count languages, it might be the most common word order. It's slightly more common than the English style word order. Okay, so, you know, here's, an, here's a single switch that you can flick, right? Uh, do your heads precede your compliments or do they follow your compliments? So in English, the heads precede the compliments. Uh, in Japanese and lots of other languages, they follow the compliments. Um, this is one basic difference between languages. Um, now, <laughs> it used to be um, that this was the point in the class where, you know, uh, I would tell you that and I would, I would wait just long enough for you to be impressed by that and then I would quickly change the subject and hope that none of you spoke German. Um, because there are languages out there, sadly, in which some heads are initial and other heads are final. That is, some heads precede their compliments and others follow their compliments. Uh, German is such a language. Um, so, for example, languages with mixed headedness. In German, here's German for that Mary could eat sushi with chopsticks. And you can see um, the German complementizer precedes the clause. So the German complementizer for that is das, and it goes before the, the clause, just like in English. Uh, and German has prepositions. So, you know, with chopsticks is mit Stäbchen. Um, uh, so with goes before chopsticks. You know, German has prepositional phrases, just like English. But German verbs, and German tense, you know, whatever we'd put in T, these kinds of auxiliaries, at least in this kind of clause, we'll come back to this, they come after their compliments. So uh, the, if you're saying in German, I thought that Mary could eat sushi with chopsticks, the word order is literally going to be something like, I thought that Mary with chopsticks, sushi eat could. Um, Mark Twain has uh, a great essay uh, called The Awful German Language, uh, in which he says many hilariously partially accurate things about German. Um, one of them being that so he says something like, uh, when a German dives into a sentence, that is the last you will see of him until he, em he emerges from the other side of the Atlantic with his verb in his mouth. Um, uh, he's making fun of the fact that German often has the verb at the end of the sentence. And, uh, um, goes on and on about how, you know, you, it's very easy to forget what exactly is being done to these things. They're just being named. And find out the verb weeks later. Um, so yeah, okay, so in English, heads precede their compliments, in Japanese, heads follow their compliments, and in other languages, some, some other languages, like German, um, you get both. There are some heads that precede compliments and others that follow their compliments, okay? Uh, yeah, Faith. Is there any rule for like, which heads precede the Ah, good, good question. That, that was the next question I was going to ask myself rhetorically. Thank you for asking me non-rhetorically. Uh, you might wonder, okay, fine, so, you know, uh, do we just have to say for every head in every language, this head precedes, this head follows? Or is there any rule? Do we get to say anything more interesting than that? It turns out that there are kinds of systems that don't exist, which is kind of interesting. So um, let's concentrate on the heads T and V. So we're going to look at uh, embedded clauses like this one where you've got something intense, an auxiliary of some kind, and you've got a verb, and there's also an object. Um, and we're going to look at the orderings of those two heads, T with respect to the verb phrase and the verb with respect to the object. Um, if you do that, here's what you find. You get languages like English, in which has and read both precede their complements. You get languages like German, in which read and has both follow their complements. That's why they're both blue. You get languages like West Flemish, um, which is a language closely related to Dutch, um, uh, spoken, I assume, in West Flem, um, uh, in which the auxiliary, bless you, the auxiliary precedes the verb phrase and in which the verb follows the object. So in West Flemish, you say that John wants a house to buy. Yeah, or buy. Um, I wasn't able to do, I don't speak West Flemish, so I wasn't able to do that John has read a book. I guess I should make all of these. John wants to buy a house. Um, so, okay, so you get languages like English in which both of those precede their 
their complements, both the T and the V precede their complements. You get languages like German in which they both follow. You get languages like West Flemish in which the auxiliary precedes and the verb follows. But you never get the fourth imaginable kind of language. Not ever. People have looked quite hard. Yeah? Where I, again, I'm using silly diacritics to emphasize the fact that this language doesn't exist. I'm making it up. Yeah? So there are no languages in which you say that John read the book has. That's not a possible human language for some reason. Um, so we get English, where those heads both precede their complements. We get German, where they both follow their complements. We get West Flemish, where the lower head follows the complement, is head final, so the verb follows the object, but the higher head, T, precedes its complement, the T is head initial. You never get the mirror image of West Flemish. That doesn't happen. It not only doesn't happen, but it sometimes fails to happen in kind of interesting ways. Um, here's a fact about Finnish. Uh, uh, Finnish word order um, is mostly sort of English, like uh, T and V both precede their complements. But just if you're asking WH questions, for some reason, Finnish word order becomes quite random. Um, so uh, you can ask questions like, when would you see have written a novel in the English word order where both of those heads are red because they're preceding their complements? You can ask it in the German word order where both of those heads are following their complements. So you're literally saying, when you see a novel written would have. You can say it in the West Flemish order where <coughs> The auxiliary precedes the verb phrase, and the verb comes after the object. But you cannot say it in the cross-linguistically unattested order. So it isn't just that there are no languages like that. Even in languages like Finnish, where there's a fair amount of freedom of word order, that order is ruled out, which is weird. <laughs> it would be nice to have a theory of that. People have worked on theories of that. Um, there's something called the final over final constraint that's been offered. It's called the FOFC by people who are into it. Uh, what the FOFC says is, at least for certain parts of the tree, if you have two heads, A and B, and A has inside its complement another head, B, then if A is head final, if A follows its complement, B also has to follow its complement. It's as though, as you're building the tree, we've been bu building trees sort of the way we built this one, where you start, you know, you're doing repeated merge, right? You start at the bottom of the tree, and you keep adding things, and the tree gets larger and larger. It's as though, at the beginning, you decide whether your heads are going to proceed or follow their complements, and then you can switch to being head initial, but just once. Uh, after you've decided to be head initial, you have to be head initial from then on. You can't go back to being head final, something like that. You can, you can switch from being, if, as you're building the tree from the bottom up, you can switch from being head final to being head initial. You can switch from having heads follow their complements to having heads precede their complements. That's what West Flemish does, where it has the verb after the object, and then it has the auxiliary before the verb phrase. But you can't switch in the other direction. That's what this seems to say. For certain parts of the tree, we may get a chance to talk more about that. Yeah? I'm sorry, by head and complement, I just mean, uh, so heads are things like this, uh, uh, nodes that just dominate a word and, and don't contain anything else. And the complement of a head is its sister. So here's a head, and here's its complement. So this VP is the complement of this head, um, or this head has as its complement the sushi, or this head has as its complement this noun phrase, the chopsticks. And the observation is that if you have, uh, um, you can have head final heads lower down. Yeah, you can have heads that follow their complements lower down and heads that precede their complements higher up, but you can't have the opposite. Yeah? So in that example, you are saying that will dominate. Will is not head. Yep. And the uh, D box is uh, has also, it has also has to follow. So yeah, what we're saying is, if we go back to these trees, what we're saying is um, in the tree on the far right, because the V precedes its complement, the higher T must also precede its complement. That's what the final over final constraint is meant to say. Um, if the lower head follows the complement, then it's okay for the higher head to precede or follow. But if the lower head precedes, then the higher head must also precede. It cannot follow. I hope I wrote it right. 
if A follows its complement, B must also, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A follows its complement, B must also, yes, yes, yes. So um, in, in the trees, in the even numbered trees, where the higher head follows its complement, what we're seeing where T follows its complement, so that's the A, what we're seeing is that in trees like that, the lower head must also follow its complement. It can't proceed. So that's what the final over final constraint says. It's an unfortunately named constraint. It's misleading, but that's what it that's what it does. Okay? So we get that kind of mixed headedness, the West Flemish kind, but not the not the kind on the right. Um yeah, so uh uh, oh, I mixed up my terminology here. I'm sorry, I'll fix this slide before I post it. So the, this is the Fafka violation. T, I called it I, which I shouldn't have done. That's an older word for TP. T has V in its complement, and T follows VP, but V is not following NP. That's what makes that a final over final constraint violation. Okay? Um, for certain parts of the tree. Now, for certain parts of the tree, there have to be restrictions on how this applies. So um, German, for example, uh, we've just said that if the higher heads are final, the lower head also has to be final. So the fact that the T is final means that the V also has to be final. So far, so good. But the P is head initial. So the people who do the FOFC have to talk about domains of the tree in which the FOFC applies. So it applies to the relationship between T and the verb, but not to the relationship between, say, the verb and the prepositional phrase. Uh, prepositional phrases, it's like they talk as though the FOFC kind of starts over at certain points. So you, you calculate it within the prepositional phrase, or you calculate it within the noun phrase, but then you start again. Uh, uh, there are other parts of the tree to which the FOFC applies, but not across those boundaries. Uh, lots of work on trying to figure out why that would be. Lots of questions about the FOFC, like why is it true? Uh, and which chunks of the tree is it true in? But uh, I'm telling you about it because it looks like another case of a linguistic universal, so another place where, uh, yes, there's more than one kind of language. There are head initial languages like English. There are head final languages like uh, Japanese. There are languages like German, which have some initial heads and other final heads. But you don't get every logically possible combination of initial and final. Um, that's, uh, that's the result of this. And the FOFC is meant to describe that, and then, of course, we want to know why the FOFC is true, if it turns out to be true. Yeah? OK. Are there, does it make sense? Are there questions about this? FOFC, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I called you FOFC. Faith. <laughs> 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 I, I will stop calling you FOFC. Oh, oh, oh. Um, I mean, sometimes this is just a matter of stating the universals in a particular way. So uh, uh, every language has the property that it obeys the FOFC. There. <laughs> you know. um, there are some other things sort of like that. So for example, it is true of every language in which the verb comes at the beginning of the clause that WH movement uh, happens overtly, at least optionally. So uh, we said there are languages that do overt WH movement. There are languages that have WH in situ. There are languages that have both options. Um, and there are verb initial languages that have both options. And there are verb initial languages that have overt movement. There are no verb initial languages with obligatory WH in situ. That never happens. And again, we want to understand why, but that's a, that's a fact. These parts where I keep saying we want to understand why, that's because uh, there is work on this. Um, I have a book that tries to derive that fact I just told you about. Um, but uh, I, feel, I would feel bad um, teaching you uh, theories that I have posited in a book uh, because uh, I could be wrong. It's, I know it's hard to believe, but, uh, but I could be. So uh, I'm only trying to tell you things that are definitely true in this class. Good question. Are there other questions? OK. All right. So that was it for German. Oh, right. Sorry. Back to German. Um, OK, so here we are doing German. Now, um, I said, uh, I think I said this accurately, that in this kind of clause in German, the verb comes after the object, and tense comes after the verb phrase, and 
and I think I saw people who know some German furrow their brows at me, because that's not the word order in a German main clause. Uh, so I want to talk now about the word order in a German main clause. Here's the word order in a German main clause. You say in German things like, Mary could, with chopsticks, sushi eat. So the verb is still after its object, but T is no longer at the end. It's now, well, earlier, it's right after Mary. Yeah. Um, this is a property of German main clauses uh, that the thing that's in T, if there is something that's in T, has to be uh, preceded by exactly one phrase. So you can say, Mary could with chopsticks sushi eat. You can say, with chopsticks could Mary sushi eat. You can say, sushi could Mary with chopsticks eat. There's, you get to take some phrase and put it first. And then what's in T, what would be in T, uh, could, that has to be second. Yeah. This is called verb second. Um, these exa are examples where there's an auxiliary in second position. If there is no auxiliary, then the thing that goes in second position is the verb. Um, so uh, if you wanted to say, Mary eats sushi with chopsticks, so there's no auxiliary, you would take the verb eat, you'd put it in a different form, it would be ist, um, and it would go in the place where could is going in these sentences. Yeah. Something else uh, would be in first position. So this is a phenomenon called V2. It's called V2 because you must take exactly one phrase and put it first, and then T or the verb goes second. So you can say all of these things in German, but you cannot say, for example, with chopsticks, sushi could Mary eat, or anything like that. There can't be two phrases in the first position. Yeah. Um, there must be exactly one phrase in the first position. So verb second. German clauses, German main clauses, actually we'll refine that in just a second. They have to start with exactly one phrase, followed by the verb, where I've put verb in quotes, because as you've seen, it doesn't have to be the verb. It's actually whatever tense is on. Um, so if there's an auxiliary, then uh, that's the thing that goes first. If there's no auxiliary, then tense is realized on the verb. Uh, the verb is pronounced with tense morphology, and that's what goes in second position. Okay. Why am I telling you all this? Well, partly so that you can be more fully educated people. Now you know some things about the grammar of German. Um, but uh, actually, oh, sorry, yes, that's the wrong rhetorical move to make. Um, uh, sorry, more German. Um, no, actually, let me finish the rhetorical move I was just making. I'm telling you all this about German partly to show you some cool things about German, but what we're going to see shortly is that this is not just German. V2 is a cross-linguistically common phenomenon. There are many languages out there that are V2. Um, uh, so uh, learning this fact about, these facts about German um, will do you some good when you are confronted with for example, Kashmiri or uh, Dinka or a number of other languages that are out there, which are also V2. OK, but first, um, I just said German main clauses, and then I waffled a little bit about whether I meant main clauses. It isn't actually just main clauses. What it is is clauses that don't have complementizers, don't have overt complementizers. So main clauses uh, uh, are V2, but also embedded clauses as long as they don't start with das. So you can say there are, there's what's called embedded V2, where you have an embedded clause, like the one on the German example at the bottom of this slide, uh, where the, the, you're doing the V2 phenomenon again. And I can't remember whether I proved that. Yeah, so I didn't. But you could put any phrase in the place of Mary. Uh, every, all the shenanigans that we did with the main clause in the last slide, you can do with the embedded clause here. So he said, Mary wanted with chopsticks sushi eat, you could have put with chopsticks or sushi in the place where Mary is. And then Mary would have to be after wanted. Right? So there's one phrase that goes before the auxiliary in that embedded clause. It's an embed in case of embedded V2. Um, what's the difference between this type of embedded clause and the kinds that I, we looked at in the first German sentence when we were just talking about mixed headedness? Well, it has to do with whether there's a complementizer. So if your embedded clause starts with das, which is the German word for that, the German complementizer for declarative clauses, then you don't get V2. And main clauses, which don't have a complementizer, just like in English, uh, also uh, have V2. So V2 happens whenever there isn't a complementizer being pronounced. A hypothesis that people have had about that goes like this. The tree for German is exactly the tree that I drew for you before. It's got a complementizer uh, that precedes its complement, and then under that complementizer, everything is head final in the sort of verbal part of the clause. So the 
auxiliary follows the verb phrase and the verb follows its object. And then yes, German has prepositions instead of postpositions because the Fafk resets itself across prepositional phrase boundaries. Uh, so that's the tree that we, we drew before for German clauses. Uh, complementizers go before the TP. And then what we're learning is that if nothing is pronounced in uh, the complementizer, if you don't have a das, then two things happen. First, some phrase, you get to pick some phrase at random, moves into the specifier of CP. Um, so here I've chosen to move the sushi into the specifier of CP. And also, some head moves into C. The consequence of these two movements is the pattern that we just saw. Um, first of all, the auxiliary, although we've seen that when there is a das, the auxiliary is head final, the auxiliary goes where the complementizer would be. It becomes head initial. Right, so it goes almost at the beginning of the sentence. But not quite. There has to be exactly one phrase to its left. And the story is that's the phrase that's at the left edge of CP. Raising many questions like, why Germans? Why are you doing this? <laughs> but as I say, they do. And there are many languages out there that do this. There's a lot of interesting work on um, how you choose which phrase to randomly move into first position. It has consequences for the interpretation of the sentence, which are pretty subtle and difficult to talk about. There are people who talk about them, try to figure them out. Uh, they have to do with uh, which phrase you're trying to draw someone's attention to, or so on. It's very, very difficult stuff to talk about seriously. You know? um, but since we're not doing semantics yet, since we're doing syntax, we can just say this is a thing that happens. Some phrase goes into first position, and then uh, whatever's in T goes into, goes into second position. Uh, so you are moving a phrase into the specifier of CP, and you are moving a head, in particular the head T, is moving into C. That's the, how you get German, the German V2 order. OK? You're stunned by German. It's understandable. It's pretty stunning. Now, this is the part that I, I thought I was going to tell you before, but now I will. Um, it's not just German. So uh, there are languages, uh, some of them completely unrelated to German, others only very distantly related to German, that have exactly this uh, setup. So Kashmiri um, is an Indo-Aryan language spoken in Kashmir, uh, in which um, there must be some phrase in first position. And so you say things like, Ram gave Sham a book. Um, some phrase has to go first. And uh, uh, you, when there's no auxiliary, the verb goes right after that first phrase. But when there is an auxiliary, like in the second example, the auxiliary goes in that second position. And uh, the verb, in this case, goes at the end. Uh, and the thing that goes in first position doesn't have to be the subject. You can see that in the last example. Uh, where uh, you've put an adverb in first position. So uh, Kashmiri is just uh, a very, very odd dialect of German, basically, right? So the, the word order for the rules for word order for Kashmiri resemble the rules for word order uh, for German to a, to a surprising degree. I was making a joke when I said that it's a dialect of German. It's not. It's, uh, they're both Indo-European languages, so they're related, but extremely distantly. Um, they don't have anything else in common, but they have this in common. Vata, which is a crew language of Ivory Coast, uh, literally not related to German, also a V2 language. And a bunch of others. Uh, Karitiana, which is a Tupian language spoken in Brazil. Uh, English, which is a Nahdagastanian language uh, spoken in the Caucasus. Uh, Dinka, which is a Nilotic language spoken in South Sudan. V2 is a thing. It's not a hugely common thing. But it's a thing you find scattered all over the world. There are lots of V2 languages out there. That's one of the factory options for language word order is uh, being V2. So lots of languages out there. So v verb second is all over the place. And in our system, what it consists of is head movement to head initial C and movement of some phrase, some randomly chosen phrase, to the specifier of CP. OK, now, why am I making such a big deal about this? We know that complementizers can be final. So, uh, German complementizers are head initial. We, we know that by looking at them when they're overt. So German has this complementizer das, which is their version of that. It's actually related to the English word that. Um, we can see that it's head initial. 
And um, we can also see from German V2 that German V2 involves moving the, complement, the auxiliary, or if there is no auxiliary, the verb, uh, into C, uh, which causes it to be in second position. So now it precedes uh, the verb phrase, precedes the rest of the clause, and uh, there's some phrase in its specifier. We know that there can be languages in which C is head final. I showed you that earlier. There are languages like Japanese in which C uh, goes at the end. Japanese has a word for that too. It's still, it goes after the clause that, uh, that it combines with. So it wouldn't be hard to build a language that would be the mirror image of German, right? So this would be a language in which um, you'd have your clause, your TP, and it would have in it whatever it would have, and there would be a head final C, and you would move some phrase, XP, into a specifier of CP that would be over here. This wouldn't be hard, right? This is just German, except that in German, um, the C is over here, and the complementizer that you're moving into is over here. Right, so this is German. There is some phrase in, in TP which is moving into the specifier of CP, which is over here. C is over here. And this is V2. This is the V2 word order. This is German and Kashmiri and Kru and Dinka and and and. There are lots of languages like that. So are there any languages like this? No. None. Lots of languages like this. No languages like that. Right? That's not a thing. Raising lots of questions. Like, well, wait, why, why is that not? Because it's not, right? It's not hard to describe that language on the left. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't exist, sorry, that language on the right. Uh, the language on the left is quite common, cross-linguistically, you know, well attested. Language on the right doesn't happen. Yeah. So could there be a language like this? No such language has ever been found. And although there are verb second languages, plenty of them, and so forget about trees for a second. Suppose you thought all of these trees I've been showing you, you know, put them out of your mind. Uh, we should really just be thinking about verbs and subjects and objects and things like that. We should forget about trees. Um, it's a fact that there are verb second languages, again, plenty of them scattered all over the world, not related to each other, not, a, not the result of contact. Yeah, it's apparently one of the factory options for having a human language is to have it be V2. So you might imagine that there could also be, you know, direct object second languages, right? or subject second languages, languages where the subject had to be the second thing, and you could put anything you wanted to before the subject. Right? Or languages where the direct object had to be the second thing, and you could put anything you wanted to before the direct object. I wouldn't know how to draw a tree for a language like that, but it's not any harder to describe it in words than it is to describe a verb second language. Do people see what I mean? Yeah. This is a reason to take trees seriously as a way of describing languages, because they make it easy to describe German we just did it. But hard to describe these other imaginable languages, direct object second languages or subject second languages. And the fact is that those languages don't exist. Yeah. So the German kind of language, the verb second kind of language, uh, reasonably common in the world. Um, but these other languages that are not too hard to imagine, they don't happen. Uh, so we're at another one of these frustrating points in the class where I have shown you sort of a mystery. You know, there are verb second languages. There are no verb penultimate languages, mirror image of German. There are verb second languages. There are no direct object second languages. Um, and when I showed you the FOFC, we were at a similar point. Uh, the FOFC, it seems to happen. Yeah, so there are uh, languages like English and Japanese and German and West Flemish. There's another logically possible kind of language where the verb phrase is head final and the TP, sorry, where the verb phrase is head initial and the TP is head final. That language doesn't exist. And in languages like Finnish and Basque, actually I didn't show you Basque, uh, where word order is fairly free uh, under certain circumstances, that particular word order is ruled out. And then I said, uh, sure would be nice to know why. And if this were an interest in tax class, this is where I would start trying to show you why or showing pe you people's theories of why. But instead, this is 24900. And we've already spent many days talking about syntax. And I, I really have to start teaching you other things soon. So I will just tell you, if you would like to know the answers to these questions, go take more linguistics classes. Yeah, these are the kinds of things linguists uh, talk about and try to figure out. OK? So moral of all this, uh, there are different kinds of languages in the world. But the languages that we find in the world differ in ways that are constrained. Um, so we don't find every imaginable kind of language. Uh, there are gaps, sort of interesting gaps, sometimes gaps that you can um, 
define the boundaries of, like with the FOFC, where you say, yeah, uh, languages get to decide for particular heads whether they proceed or follow their sisters, but there are certain patterns that you don't find, uh, and, and we want to have a theory of why. Um, WH movements, uh, there are languages that have WH movement, there are languages that lack it, but if you have it, it goes to the left, it never goes to the right. Yeah. There are languages that have V2, there are languages that don't have V2, but there aren't languages that have you know, V uh, next to last, right? uh, uh, mirror image of V2. Uh, there is variation among languages, but there are kinds of things that you don't ever find, certain peculiar patterns that resolutely fail to show up. Um, this is the kind of thing we're talking about when we talk about universal grammar. So that's a phrase you may hear people talk about. Sometimes you hear it used as a term of abuse. So there are people who think that it's, it's a dumb idea, you know, that's uh, something that linguists care about for some reason, but nobody else should. But this is what we mean when we talk about it. We mean it looks as though part of being a human being is having the kind of mind that can build language in some ways but not others. Um, and that's what universal grammar is. It's kind of a bad name for it because it sounds like, you know, uh, we all ha start out with the grammar of, I don't know, Basque, you know, and then we learn our native languages by manipulating the universal grammar that we all start with. That's not the idea. The idea is we're constrained in the kinds of linguistic hypotheses that we can have. Uh, and uh, so we come preloaded with some instructions about how to build language. And, uh, um, you know, there are certain kinds of options that we, we know better than to even consider when we're learning our first language. Uh, that's what universal grammar is meant to, meant to claim. Yeah. Questions about any of that? Does any of this make sense? This is meant to inoculate you against. Um, so in, you know, uh, popular science, you will sometimes read people claiming that universal grammar, you know, can't possibly be true, or it's dead, or it's been misproven, or whatever. And um, this is all hooey. Yeah, you should uh, you should throw away any papers that seem to claim that. Okay. All right. So yeah, in this particular case, no v penultimate, no wh movement to the right. Um, it's as though maybe heads can either proceed or follow their sisters with certain restrictions, as we've seen in the FOFC. But specifiers maybe always precede their sisters. And again, we'd want to know why. OK. So um, we've now, so here I am pivoting. You can tell because the font size is changing. <laughs> um, uh, we've now seen several different kinds of movement operations. So we've talked about WH movement, uh, which is what makes questions like, what did you buy, where what WH moves to the specifier of CP, which is on the left periphery of the clause. Um, we've now talked about head movement. Uh, that was part of talking about German V2. So uh, in V2, which handily I still have a tree for, uh, some phrase moves to the specifier of CP and T moves into C. And that's why you get word orders like, you know, uh, prepositional phrase with chopsticks will she sushi eat, which is how you would say that in German. Um, so you'd have some phrase in first position, and then uh, whatever it is that bears tense, so the highest auxiliary, if there's an auxiliary, or the verb, if there's no auxiliary, ends up in C. And I, I just sort of casually said, hey, look, this head is moving to this other head. That's called head mov movement. Um, I do a lot of head movement as I'm teaching. Some of you may have noticed. Uh, um, and then we've also talked about NP movement. That was the case where you took a noun phrase and moved it into the specifier of TP. So uh, three kinds of movement then. We've got uh, what did you buy, uh, where what is uh, WH moving. Um, we've got uh, German, so in German, uh, with chopsticks. Will she sushi eat? Where we have reasons to think that auxiliary start at the end of the clause and head move. So here's head movement. And then the last one is NP movement. Uh, and that was uh, how we were going to deal with sentences like um, the sushi was devoured, where we think that devour selects for an object, needs to have an object. But in this case, its object isn't there because it's moved over here. This is NP movement. 
It's moved over here because uh, of the EPP. TP needs to have a specifier, and the sushi has raised to become the specifier of uh, TP. So WH movement and head movement and NP movement, and I can see that I've used my own private abbreviation for movement, which is MVMT, uh, because if you're a syntactician, you have to write the word movement a lot. So that's uh, that's my abbreviation for movement. Yeah. Yep. So three kinds of movement that we've talked about so far. Are there any questions about any of that? Because we're about to talk about those movements and their properties in a little bit of detail. Okay. So Mary will type novels. We've talked about head movement. We haven't talked about it in this case, but here's a place where we could talk about it. There's a way to ask questions, uh, yes, no questions, where you take whatever's in T and you move it into C. So you start with variable type novels, you move T into C, and so you have the word order will marry type novels. So the auxiliary now precedes the subject. So here's an instance of head movement, in this case, in order to form yes, no questions in English. Uh, WH questions, like what will marry type, uh, not only are you moving T into C, so will is moving from the position after Mary to the position before Mary, but you're doing the WH movement that we've talked about before. Uh, the object is moving into the specifier of CP. Yeah. And then in NP movement, uh, the cookies were devoured. We've taken the object of devour and moved it into the spec of TP because TP needs a specifier. Yeah? We've seen that not all languages have all of these kinds of movement. <clears throat> so uh, there are languages with WH in situ. This is the Chaha example. Um, Chaha is a language spoken in Ethiopia. It's a Semitic language. Um, it was actually, I, I, I teach the, um, the graduate uh, field methods class. Um, and uh, Chaha was the first uh, language that we, uh, that we worked on. Um, uh, he's the, that's the one, I think I've told you this story. That's the one in which I tried to start the class by saying, uh, the man cooked the meat, and the guy who was, uh, we were working with said, no, I cannot say that. And I said, why? He said, men do not cook. I was like, oh, OK. Um, so uh, Chaha, he also taught us an expression for uh, very quickly, which meant in the time it takes spit to evaporate, um, which I thought was a, a cool expression to have. I wish I could remember how to say that in Chaha. I should, should go look it up. Um, so Chaha is a WH in situ language. It leaves the WH phrase where objects normally go. It's also a head final language. It has the same word order as Japanese. Um, uh, it's a WH in situ language. So there are languages that leave WH in situ. They don't move it. There are languages that don't go in for NP movement, at least as much as English does. So uh, in English, I would have to say uh, the cookies have been eaten. But in Italian, you can say something that literally means have been eaten the cookies. So the cookies can just stay in object position. The Italians don't have the EPP. They're very relaxed about uh, whether TP has a specifier or not. So the cookies can just stay where they are. They don't have to go anywhere. So Chaha doesn't have to move its WH phrases. Italian doesn't have to move its NPs. <clears throat> there are also cross-linguistic differences with respect to where heads go. Um, so. Uh, Here's an English sentence. Mary often speaks French, uh, where I've put an adverb. Um, I've, I've uh, adjoined it's an adjunct. It's not selected by anything. That adverb phrase often, uh, I've, I've attached it to the verb phrase there. Uh, and then you've got a verb with its object, speaks French. Yeah. If any of you speak French, does anybody speak French? So if any of you know any French, a couple of you do, it looks like maybe you know, this isn't the right word order for French. The right word order for French involves taking the word for speaks and putting it before often. So you can't, in French, say, Mary often speaks French. You must literally say, Mary speaks often French, which in English we cannot say. Yeah. So this is a, another sort of basic difference between languages. Uh, French requires the verb to raise to T. Sorry, I called it I again. I'll try to fix that. Uh, uh, French requires the verb to raise to T um, when there's no auxiliary. So you say, Mary speaks often French. Um, English doesn't require the verb to raise to T. So uh, just like uh, English requires the WH phrase to move to the specifier CP, and Chaha doesn't, Mandarin doesn't, Japanese doesn't. Um, French requires the verb to raise to T, to move to T. Uh, uh, English doesn't. Yeah. So there are differences between languages along these lines, where uh, one language will have one set of movements, and another language will have another set of movements. That's a thing we find. It would be nice to know why. We try to derive this from something else. But that's, that's where the field is right now. Um, I haven't talked 
very much about why these movement hap movements happen, uh, and I won't, mainly for reasons of time. It's a very interesting topic. There's a lot of work on it. I'm trying to figure out what it is that drives these movements, causes them to happen. Uh, so the only one that I've really given you a, a motivation for is, uh, is NP movement, which I've said is driven by the EPP, the need for uh, TP to have a specifier, which is a need that exists in some languages but not others. So English has that, and Italian, for example, doesn't. Um, but I do want to talk some, so I haven't talked about why these movements happen, but I, I want to talk some about some of the conditions on movement, because what we're going to see is that movement can't always happen, uh, and we're going to want to try to understand why. So you can say things like, I ordered a hamburger and french fries, but um, it would be weird for me to ask you a question like, what did you order a hamburger and? Do people agree? That's a strange question to ask. Um, this is sometimes called the coordinate structure constraint. Um, and it's one of many examples where people have found uh, that WH movement, this is a WH movement example, is somehow blocked. Um, so all of the WH movement examples I've shown you so far, it's always been possible to move the WH phrase. There are times when it's not possible, and this is one example. So uh, what did you order a hamburger and? No good. It's roughly, if you have two things that are connected by and, you can't WH move one of them. You also can't say, what did you order and a hamburger? Right? Or you move the first one instead of the second one. Also no good. Yeah? Yeah? I'm sorry, say it again. The second one sounded fine. What? what Yeah. Mm -hmm. The first one. Yeah, this one. What did you order? Hamburger and. You mean if somebody asked you that, you'd just be like, French fries. Huh? You'd just say French fries. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, um, several other people are raising their hands, so maybe I'll just open this to general discussion. Yeah, Joseph? Um, I feel like it would be natural to put a colon after order. I don't know what that would do, like, syntactically, but oh. what did you order? A hamburger and. And then, like, a list. Yeah, um, so forget about and for a second. I think it's possible to say, OK, you ordered, and have that be a question, right? So it's, it's your job to fill in the blank for me. And uh, I think what you just did is a version of that where I say, what did you order? That's the WH question. And now I'm going to ask you to help me finish the sentence for me. I think that's what's going on. Katerina? When you say you ordered dot, 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 yeah. is that equivalent to not doing WH movement and just not pronouncing the what? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't know whether we want the syntax to handle that or not, or whether we want that to be like the kind of case I talked about before. Uh, so I, because I think there's a restriction on that technique. For example, it has to be the end of the sentence. You have to stop talking before you get to the end. I can't say, you ordered and a hamburger. I don't think, right? Uh, so I think what I'm doing is simulating forgetting how my sentence was going to end, right? So it's really as though, you know, I'm about to say you ordered a hamburger, and I'm pretending that I can't remember how to end the sentence, and I'm asking you to help me. Um, I have a feeling that's the kind of way we want to think about that kind of example. But, uh, but yeah. Rachel? Yeah. 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 So good. Good point. And maybe that's got something to do with your reaction that um, you are being maximally charitable to the person you're talking to. If somebody said, "What are you ordering a hamburger? What did you order a hamburger and?" Um, you do your best to pretend that they said something grammatical. It's clear what they meant, and so you're going to pretend that they said with instead of and. 
Um, maybe there's something like that going on. This is reminding me of a, there's work on, um, what's it called? I think it's called the Moses Illusion, um, where people have observed that if you ask people how many animals of each kind did Moses take on the ark, um, where if you're familiar with the Bible, you know that Moses did not take any animals on the ark. Uh, the ark was Noah, a uh, different guy. Uh, <laughs> Noah was the one who took animals on the ark. And so the real response to that is supposed to be, hold on, no, Moses didn't take any animals on the ark. But that if you do a survey in which you walk up to people at random and say, how many animals of each type did Moses take on the ark? What they typically do very often is pretend that you said Noah. Uh, so they pretend that you, that you asked the question in a way that makes sense, and they tell you, they tell you to which uh, is actually not, if I, I, as I said, I've been reading the Bible lately because of this Wampanoag project. Noah, I hadn't remembered this, but Noah took two of some kinds of animals, but more of other kinds. It had to do with whether they were edible or not, um, I think. So whether the, the, um, the laws for what you're allowed to eat allowed you to eat them. Uh, if, if it was okay to eat them, he took more, I guess, so that there would be some to spare. Um, yes. So I suspect that that's what's going on with you, but it's an interesting question. Actually, the, your, your point raises an interesting point, which is that these, we're gonna talk about several cases of this kind where uh, a, a WH phrase seems to be constrained from moving from a particular place. And the examples are always gonna be examples, hopefully, where it's not that you can't figure out what the other person means. Right? It's not that these are unthinkable. They're just unsayable. Um, you know, it's not the, not the right way to say it. Actually, the next example, I think, is particularly uh, clear in that regard. So here are two sentences. We've talked a lot about embedded clauses, and I, I guess when we were talking about German, I touched on the fact that embedded clauses sometimes have start with complementizers. Um, our English sentences have pretty reliably started with complementizers, but they, they don't have to, right? So you can say, I think that Mary should win the election, where there's a that, but you can also say, I think Mary should win the election. There's no complementizer there. And then linguists get very sort of curious about whether, okay, this, I got asked this question in class at one point, um, does that mean that I should draw different trees for these? Or does it mean that the embedded clause should be a CP in both cases and that C can either be pronounced that or, right, that C has a pronunciation where it's just not pronounced. Um, and uh, that's a, you know, a debate that people have. We don't have to have it. But let me call your attention to a fact, which doesn't hold actually for all English speakers, but for some it does. Um, in my English, it's okay to ask questions like, who do you think should win the election? But questions like, who do you think that should win the election are no good for me. Am I the only person like that here? Is there anybody for whom these are both fine? Are you communicating with me in ASL or? The asterisk means it's bad. Okay, good. Yeah. So you're 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 like I mean, interesting. Yeah. It would be okay if that were not true, but uh, yeah, there are people for whom both of these are fine. Uh, so occasionally, when I'm teaching this class, I'll do this slide, and I'll look out in the audience, and there'll be one person who looks really alarmed. You know, like I'm, they're hallucinating, and I'm like, "You're from the Midwest, aren't you?" And they're like, "Yes." Uh, so there, <laughs> there's there's a part of America where they do this. It's uh, something about living in big flat areas with lots of agriculture. I guess that uh, um, it's it's okay to say these things. Uh, uh, there's a lot of interesting questions about you know why or what it is that distinguishes some dialects of English from others, because it's not as if you know uh, you cover this in high school you know or your mom and dad punish you if you say who do you think that should win the election right that's not what happens but uh, uh, for most native speakers of English uh, there's this contrast it's called the that trace effect uh, never mind why well because uh, the idea is it's impossible to have a that immediately followed by uh, the place the WH phrase came from. To imagine that the WH phrase, when it moves, it leaves traces of itself behind, I guess. It's the metaphor. Yeah. Um, this is specifically about, um, I, I guess this came out in the way I just described it. It's specifically about extraction of subjects. So it's bad to say, who do you think that should win the election? Uh, but it's okay to say things like, who do you think that we should vote for? So the generalization is not, you can't WH move past a that. It's okay to WH move past a that. It's just not okay to WH move past a that, which is right next to you. Um, and uh, 
lots of interesting work on what the heck is going on. Yeah? Um, again, uh, let me just urge you, if you would like to know more about this, go take more linguistics classes. This is something linguists work on, trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Um, another example of movement not being possible. Uh, we actually had an example like this earlier. Mo all of our CPs so far, most of our CPs so far, have been complements of verbs. So we've said things like, I think that she should win the election, where that she should win the election is the complement of think. Or people believe that the moon is made of green cheese, where believe takes as its sister, its complement, uh, a CP that the moon is made of green cheese. It's also possible for CPs to be subjects, as in that the moon is made of green cheese is widely believed. That's False, but grammatical. Yeah. People agree. It's OK. It's not the most natural thing I've said today, but it's grammatical. Yeah. Now, so there's a tree for that the moon is made of green cheese is widely believed. We've got a CP, which is sitting in the specifier of a TP. It's the subject of is widely believed. Yeah. Um, now let's do some WH movement. It's OK to ask questions like, what do people believe that the moon is made of? Right? So we took that first sentence, and we WH moved. We turn, turned green cheese into what, and we WH moved it. What do people believe that the moon is made of? Fine. But you can see where this is going. What is that the moon is made of widely believed? Owl. Yeah. So you know. That the moon is made of green cheese is widely believed. OK, that's possibly a little awkward, not something I'm likely to say in casual conversation. But the last example is just word salad, to use the technical term. Yeah, uh, it's um, very unclear what the heck it's supposed to mean. Do people agree? I, I, again, I'm reporting my memory of judgments that I had when I was young and carefree. Um, but I'm pretty sure this is true. I just can't say these things. Yep. All right, so you know these are these kinds of examples are all just meant to show you. Um, uh, there are some kinds of things that you can't wh move out of. Uh, so if you coordinate two things, you can't wh move one of them. Uh, the that trace effect is a condition on extraction of subjects specifically. You can't wh move those if there's a that right to their left. Uh, and uh, if you have a clause which is a subject, like that the moon is made of green cheese is widely believed. Uh, you can't WH extract out of that. There's a metaphor that's often used for these kinds of restrictions. The things that you can't move out of are called islands. So this last one I've identified for you as a subject island. Um, so I guess the idea is supposed to be that uh, uh, if you're a WH phrase and you're on an island, uh, WH phrases cannot swim. Uh, there is no boat. There is no bridge. Uh, if you're on an island, you're doomed. You cannot get out. Um, uh, you're stuck. So there's a thriving literature and syntax in which people identify islands and try to figure out why the things are islands that are islands. We hope that this will teach us some things about the mechanics of extraction. Yeah. I want to show you a particular class of island effects or cases where uh, movement is impossible uh, and, and show you a little bit of the work that people have done to try to make some progress on why these particular things um, uh, block extraction. I think we have time to at least get started on this, and then we might have to finish it next time. <clears throat> so there are a number of kinds of restrictions on movement that could be unified, and I'll show these to you in a second, that could be unified uh, into a single condition, which we could call shortest move. It says, if you have a choice between two different movement operations, you should pick the one that's shorter. Um, and people are kind of excited by that because it sounds like cognitively plausible. You know, if you're uh, trying to decide between movement operations, you should pick a short one over a long one. Um, uh, I'm going to show you a definition of short in a second. Um, please don't go you know, tattoo this on your arm or anything. There's no, it's not all that important that we define it carefully for purposes of what we're going to do in this class. In uh, theoretical work on this topic, it is important to define it carefully. And there's work on trying to figure out exactly how to define it. But here's one definition. You could say, um, take the path and take a movement operation. And we'll consider, let me show you a movement operation. Um, so here's a movement operation where we took with chopsticks in this V2 example, and we moved it out of the TP and into the C. Um, and we'll talk about the path of a movement. And that'll be the set of nodes 
that dominate the original position, the position you moved out of, and don't dominate the landing site. So um, in this particular case of movement, uh, this CP dominates the landing site. But then there are a bunch of other nodes, like this one and this one and a bunch of other ones inside this TP that dominate this XP here. And those are what we'll refer to as the path. Um, and to claim that a move has to be as short as possible is to claim that you want the path to be, well, as small as possible. Um, and uh, there's some interesting work on trying to figure out what happens. So in, in the cases I'm going to show you, the two paths are in a subset relation, one of them just contains a subset of the nodes that are in the other one. Uh, and there's an interesting question about what happens if they just overlap. Do you actually count nodes? People sort of hope not, and it looks like the answer might be no. Uh, we won't look at any of the relevant cases today. So movement A is going to be shorter than movement B if the path of A contains a smaller set of nodes than the path of B. And I'll show you some, some trees that will hopefully make that clearer. So let me show you a case where shortest move is useful, uh, something called the head movement constraint. Um, which was invented by Lisa Travis, who's a syntactician, now teaches at McGill University uh, up in Montreal. <coughs> um, the head movement constraint says this. Here's a case of head movement. I showed it to you before, uh, where we've taken what's in T and we've moved it into C. So will marry type novels. We've taken the auxiliary and we've moved it into C. Suppose instead we were to take the verb and move it into C. Well, we would end up with type marry will novels which is not the way you ask WH uh, yes, no questions in English. Yeah. Um, and in fact, this generally seems to be true, that if you are going to do head movement, um, so you're going to move some head into C, the head that you move is the higher head. It's will. It's not the lower head. It's not V. Yeah. Um, the path, so if we're talking about this in terms of paths, the path from I to C, sorry, from T to C, I have to go through and get rid of these I's, uh, this I, again, is an old uh, name for T. Um, the path from T, from will, up into C, consists of T bar and TP. Those are the nodes that dominate T and don't dominate C. But the path from V to C consists of VP and T bar and TP. Do people see that? Should I draw that tree again down here and we can, I can circle nodes and we can look at them? So when we're talking about paths, again, this is one way of measuring uh, lengths of, of movement. Uh, operations. The path from V to C is the set of nodes that dominate V that don't dominate C. So those nodes are the VP, which immediately dominates V, and the T bar, which dominates the VP, and the T, which dominates the T bar, but not the CP, which also dominates the C. Right? So we're looking just at the nodes which dominate the place the movement started and don't dominate the place that it lands. So that's the path from V to C. And that path is a superset of the path for movement from T to C, right? Because VP is in that path, but it's not in the path from T to C. Everybody see that? Is that clear? Again, we're mostly going to know short when we see it, right? So uh, another way to say all of this would have been to say, hey, look, the arrow that connects T to C is shorter than the arrow that connects V to C there, right? Or, hey, look, T, C commands V, right? So uh, uh, every node that dominates T dominates V. That would have done it, too. There are various ways to do it. But uh, uh, this talk in terms of that, this is one way people do it sometimes. OK? So head movement constraint is one of the subcases. So the head movement constraint was invented decades ago. It's one of the cases that was uh, folded into this general uh, notion of shortest move. Uh, uh, when you have a choice between things you could move, in this case, you're choosing between T and V. You have to choose T. You can't choose V. Um, it's what the head movement constraint says. Another example. <coughs> we talked a little bit about multiple WH questions, questions like who bought what. And um, speakers vary, actually. I'd be interested to hear how you guys feel, uh, how you all feel. I uh, prefer who bought what to what did who buy. Or uh, what did you give to whom sounds better to me than who did you give what to. Do people? Agree with me about that? Does that sound true? I saw some of you nodding encouragingly as I was doing this. Maybe you just wanted to be friendly. I appreciate that. Yeah? I prefer the first options, but I don't think that the second options are ungrammatical. Yeah. So this is different from the head movement constraint in at least that regard, right? The head movement constraint, if you violate the head movement constraint, you've done something very bad. It's no longer clear what you meant. Yeah. Whereas if I say, what did who buy? 
people will look at me funny, but you know, people look at me funny anyway. That's kind of what life is like. Yeah. Um, still, I also agree with Katerina that the first examples are better than the second examples. This is sometimes called superiority. Um, uh, this is the phenomenon that if you have two WH phrases and you're trying to pick which one to move, there's a preference, as Katerina I think accurately says, it's not a hugely strong preference, but it's a preference for moving the higher one, the first one. Yeah. And this is kind of like the head movement constraint, and people have you know, subsumed it under shortest move. You've got a choice between two things to move. You ought to move the, the higher one, the one that where for which the movement will be shorter. Yeah? Could this be related in some ways to like what the most important part of the sentence is? Like if you're, if you're someone, say, somebody who's actually buying something, and the thing that they're buying is like this really crazy thing, yeah. you could say, what did you buy? Ah, uh, yes. More important, what the thing received. Um, yeah, let's see now. Um, uh, huh. I'm sorry, I'm going to do an old professor's trick and talk about something different from what you talked about. Because what you said reminded me of something else. And then I'm going to talk about that thing, hopefully long enough so that you'll forget your original point. That's the goal. Um, so your job is to stop me from succeeding at this. Um, but what I thought you were going to say went like this. Um, there is a kind of WH question, we've talked about it, it's called an echo question, where I Re just repeat what you said, except that I, I substitute in a WH phrase, which is in situ. So if you say, uh, Mary just bought a motorcycle, I can say, Mary bought what? Right. And similarly, uh, if you say, Mary just bought a motorcycle, I can say, who bought a motorcycle? You know. And because that's at the beginning of the sentence, it's sort of hard to know whether that's an echo question or not. But well, at least it's possible that it is. Um, and I can do that either because it's hard to believe. There are various people I could believe bought a motorcycle, but not Mary. You know, we all know Mary would never buy a motorcycle. Um, or I could do it because I didn't hear the first word of your sentence. You know, like uh, the phone connection is bad, or we're talking on the T, or whatever, and there was a loud noise right when you said Mary, and so I didn't hear that part. And I, I can say, oh, who who bought a motorcycle? Right. Not because I'm astonished, but because I, I missed the first part of your sentence. Um, and what did who buy? That string. I think it's possible to have an echo question with WH movement in it, right? So uh, if you have just asked me, what did Mary buy? And I didn't hear you say Mary because the, the, the line was bad. So you said, what did buy? I can say, what did who buy? Which resembles what you were talking about. <laughs> um, but it's not quite the same. You want to, so, so that's a place where my two WH phrases have different goals. Um, when I say, what did who buy? I'm really asking you the question, who? And my what is quoting you. What you said was, what did buy? Right? Um, that's not what you said, but that's what I heard. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm doing a, uh, an echo question about your WH question. Yeah. My real question is about who. Your idea was that if I ask, what did who buy? What did who buy? No, you, your question was, what did who buy? What was your question? Like if you're more interested in the what than the who. If I'm more interested in the what than the who. Hmm. So this is related. Yeah. This is related to other things. Let me see, what's a, what's a good example of this? It's a thing about WH answers to WH questions. If I ask you a question like, who bought what? I want a complete list of people. I want my, my answer organized as a complete list of people together with the things that they bought. Um, whereas if I, if I make myself ask you, what did who buy? What I want is a complete list of things um, organized by things together with the people who bought them. And there's some debate about whether, so um, under normal circumstances, WH questions are supposed to be exhaustive. Uh, answers are supposed to be exhaustive. That is, if I ask you, um, what did you eat yesterday? You're, you're supposed to give me a more or less complete list. You know, if you leave out all the desserts, uh, and I'm your doctor, then you are, you're doing something wrong, right? You're supposed to tell me everything. Yeah. 
Um, there are circumstances under which it clearly isn't supposed to be exhaustive. So if I ask you a question like, where can I buy a foreign newspaper around here? You don't have to give me a complete list of the places I can buy a foreign newspaper around here. You just have to tell me a place you know, where, I, where I can go. Uh, Harvard Square, you can say. And, you know, maybe that's where I can go. And um, with multiple WH questions, there's some debate about whether the exhaustivity requirement, to the extent that it ever holds of WH questions, maybe only holds of the one that you move and not of the one that you've left in situ. That's a position people have held anyway, that there's a, there's a difference between the two. Um, and so your question about importance might be getting at that, right? It's like, I want this one completely exhausted. And then, you know, yes, I want every member of it connected to something in the other group, but it, you don't have to be exhaustive with, uh, with the pairings. Um, that might be why, I think this was Katarina's comment earlier, that the violations of this are not as strong as the violations of the head movement constraint. And it might have to do with things like this, that there are extraordinary circumstances under which these effects might be overwhelmed by your desire to have, uh, to, to prioritize one or the other. Whereas with head movement, there's nothing like that going on. You know, it's just, just got to move ahead. Um, one of the cases that people talk about when they're talking about exhaustivity is cases where you know that there's only a single pair. Um, so uh, um, if I'm eating lunch with a colleague, if I've invited a colleague to have lunch with me and we go and have lunch and then I uh, try to pay the bill, and my colleague is arguing with me about whether about who gets to pay. I might say, "Well, who invited who?" Right. Um, I'm not going to say who did who invite. And maybe it's. I think I, that's a case where the judgment is pretty clear. And and I think that might be a case where uh, there's no question of ex exhaustivity. There are only two people, right? It's either I invited you or you invited me. Like those are the only possible answers. Um, and, and so maybe that's why the, the judgment, I think, in that kind of case gets, gets stronger. Yeah. Sorry, did I ever manage to answer your question at any point of that? Yes, good. Yeah. This is all, you, you're, you're opening a can of worms, which I will now close. Yeah, there's, uh, there's lots of interesting work on exactly this problem. Yeah. And um, we're just about out of time. Yes, we're out of time, So because this one will take too long. So we'll do more shortest move next time. Uh, we'll talk more about this. Cool. Thanks. <laughs>